Hello folks, this is Jörg Lissmann from YouTube channel Jogler66 once again for another reading of the book Rulers of Evil by F. Tapper Saucy. Last time we went into the remainder of chapter 6 and then the whole chapter 7 which was called The Fingerstroke of God where we learned how the Jesuit order was formed in its basis, how Ignatius of Loyola went to become the first general of the society and in the end of chapter 7 we learned about Regimini Militantis Ecclesiae or the moment when let's call it Ignatius of Loyola presented the false oath of induction of obedience to the Pope to Pope Leo III in 1540 and when after hearing that oath that was um, cited to him by Ignatius of Loyola, the Pope cried out, Hoc est digitus Dei, this is the fingerstroke of God, and by that of course meaning that he approves not only of that oath, but of the whole concept of the Jesuit order, or the Society of Jesus. And within two years of this Regimini Militantis Ecclesiae, Paul III appointed the society to administer the Roman Inquisition. And you should not confuse that with the Spanish Inquisition, which only reported to the Spanish crown. The Roman Inquisition is something else. <laughs> Let's call it like that. Probably even worse, if that's possible. But the point is that when the Jesuits were comfortable with the Inquisition, when the Jesuits were comfortable with the Inquisition, Paul III made his move to reconcile with the Protestants. So first of all, they laid down what's going to happen to all the people who do not listen to the Roman Catholic Church, made plans for the Inquisition, and at the moment that the military order, the new formed military order of the Vatican, the Society of Jesus, was comfortable with the uh, Inquisition, at that moment the Pope decided to reconcile with the Protestants. How can you reconcile with the Protestants? This is the subject of our next chapter, chapter 8 of Rulers of Evil, called Moving In. The term Protestants was coined in 1529 to describe the large number of princes and delegates of 14 cities, largely German, who protested Emperor Charles Habsburg's attempt to enforce the Edict of Worms. And if you want to have any more information about that, then Google the, um, the, the Concile of Speyer of 1529. I did another broadcast on that. We went through that and explaining where the word protestant actually comes from, that is, at that time. This edict bound the uh, empire's 300 princely states and free cities to Roman Catholicism. The protestants proposed a compromise formula, basically a statement of the Lutheran faith, known as the Augsburg Confession. For 15 years, the Edict of Worms and the Augsburg Confession kept Catholic and Protestant rulers in a Mexican standoff. Then, on December 13, 1545, Pope Paul III called both factions to the small German-speaking northern Italian cathedral city of Trent. The promise was to resolve differences peacefully in an ecumenical council. The Council of Trent had not been seated four months, uh, had not been seated four months before it decreed that the books and biblical translations of Luther Lefebvre, Zwingli, Calvin, and other uh, quote-unquote unapproved persons were, quote, altogether forbidden and allowed to no one, since little advantage but much danger generally arises from reading them, unquote. Just going to repeat that again and other unapproved persons were altogether forbidden and allowed to no one, since little advantage but much danger generally arises from reading them. So, it's much danger in the eyes of the Roman Catholic Church when you read the writings of the Reformers, when you read the true word of God. 
Then the Jesuits moved in. Diego Lainez, Alfonso Salmeron, two of the original companions, and Claude Leger, all three in their early thirties, distinguished themselves at Trent, early on by spurning the grand style of the other delegates. They set up housekeeping in a quote-unquote narrow smoke-blackened baker's oven, and wore clothing so heavily patched and greasy that other priests were embarrassed to associate with them. They carried with them the intricate advisories from Ignatius himself, written from the delegate's point of view, as, for example, quote, When the matter that is being debated seems so manifestly just and right that I can no longer keep silent, then I shall speak my mind with the greatest composure and conclude what I have said with the words subject, of course, to the judgment of a wiser head than mine. If the leaders of the opposing party should try to befriend me, I must cultivate these men, who have influence over the heretics and lukewarm Catholics, and try to win them away from their errors with holy wisdom and love." Unquote. Most of the eighteen-year lifetime of the Council of Trent consisted of two intermissions spanning four and ten years each. At the beginning of the second intermission, Ignatius founded a special college in Rome for German-speaking Jesuits called Germanicum. Three years later, the Peace of Augsburg was established, the principal cuius regio, aius religio, which means, whose the region, his the religion. The Peace of Augsburg was Jesuit pay dirt. They could now bring whole populations to Rome simply by winning over a few princes. And so they did. By 1560, the society had returned virtually all of South Germany, and I may insert here especially Bavaria, and Austria to the church. The fruits of the Germanicum were so successful that when the Council of Trent finally adjourned on December 4, 1563, its decrees and canons conceded nothing to the Protestant reformers. Indeed, under the spiritual direction of Superior General Diego Lainez, Ignatius had died in 1556, the Council denied every Protestant doctrine point by view. Anathemized, or meaning also eternally damned, let him be anathema, you know that expression, anathemized was anyone who believed that salvation is God's free gift to his faithful and does not depend on partaking of church sacraments. Anathemized was anyone who looked to the Bible for the ultimate authority on, quote, doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness, unquote, rather than to the teaching Roman Catholic Church. Anathemized was anyone who regarded as unworthy of belief such unscriptural doctrines as, one, the effect the efficacy of papal indulgences, second, of confession alone to a priest as necessary to salvation, third, of the Mass as a true and real sacrifice of the body of Christ necessary to salvation, fourth, the legitimacy of teachings on purgatory, fifth, the celibate priesthood, six, invoking saints by prayer to intercede with God, and seventh, the veneration of relics, and eight, the use of images and symbols. And, of course, as you understand, this goes absolutely contrary to the Bible's teaching. The Council of Trent hurled 125 anathemas, eternal damnations, against Protestantism. Against Protestantism. Then, as an addendum to its closing statements, the Council recommended that the Jesuits, quote, should be given pride of place over members of other orders as preachers and professors, unquote. It was at Trent that the Roman Catholic Church began marching to the beat of the Black Papacy. A generation later, the guidelines of the Roman Inquisition under Jesuit direction were published at the command of the Cardinal's Inquisitors General. This Directorium Inquisitorum, from 1584, was dedicated to Gregory XIII, the Pope who bestowed upon Jesuits the right to deal in commerce and banking, and who also decreed 
that every papal legate should have a Jesuit advisor on his personal staff. Here follows a summary of the Directorium Inquisitorum, translated by J. P. Callender of 1838. Quote, he is a heretic who does not believe that the Roman hierarchy teaches. A heretic merits the plan of fire. By the gospel, the canons, civil law and custom, heretics must be burned. For the suspicion alone of heresy, purgation is demanded. Magistrates who refuse to take the oath for defense of faith shall be suspected of heresy. Wars may be commenced by the authority of the church. Indulgences for the remission of all sin belong to those who signed with the cross for the persecution of heretics. Every individual may kill a heretic. Persons who betray heretics shall be rewarded. Heretics may be forced to profess the Roman faith. A heretic, as he sins in all places, may everywhere be judged. Heretics must be sought after and be corrected or exterminated. Heretics enjoy no privileges in law or equity. The goods of heretics are to be considered as confiscated from the perpetration from the perpetration of the crime. The Pope can enact new articles of faith. Definitions of Popes and Councils are to be received as infallible. Inquisitors may torture witnesses to obtain the truth. It is laudable to torture those of every class who are guilty of heresy. The Pope has power over infidels. The Church may make war with infidels. Those who are strongly suspected are to be reputed as heretics. He who does not inform against heretics shall be deemed as suspected. Inquisitors may allow heretics to witness against heretics, but not for them. Inquisitors must not publish the names of informers, witnesses and accusers. Penitent heretics may be condemned to perpetual imprisonment. Inquisitors may provide for their own expenditures and the salaries of their officers from the property of heretics. Inquisitors enjoy the benefits of a plenary indulgence, a full papal forgiveness of sins, at all times in life and in death. End of this quote. The Inquisition's effect, of course, was to send the more resourceful of the heretics, protestants and liberals, who escaped torture or execution, scurrying underground, or into the Ber uh, burgeoning world of commerce, or into regions where protestant civil authorities kept inquisitors at bay. Yearning for a less intrusive religious experience, they joined attractive philosophical fraternities where they could speak freely against Roman Catholicism. For this ostensible reason, these fraternities or cults or lodges operated in secrecy. In fact, they were the remnants of the Templar network, Rosicrucians, Teutonic Knights, the numerous and various rites of Freemasonry. Like the Templars and the Jesuits, they were religious hierarchies of strict obedience. They differed from the Jesuits, however, in that their pyramid culminated in an ultimate authority no brother could identify with certainty. The highest master of a lodge received commandments from an quote-unquote unknown superior. A superior whose will the master's whole struggle up the degrees had trained him to obey without question. What the masters never realized was that this mysterious personage, as we shall examine in more detail later, was in fact none other than the Black Pope. So, just going to take a second here, something that we always said on our broadcast on nothing but the truth and nothing but the truth and on my own videos I said on Jogger 66. Keep in mind that Freemasonry only is the Protestant arm of the Jesuits. And when you follow Albert Pike and the readings of Blavatsky and I don't know other Masons, 
and especially Blavatsky, uh, who wrote, she wrote, yeah, at that time when she wrote her uh, books, uh, Isis Unveiled and the Secret Doctrine, and, and all these, you can go through this, that at the top of the hierarchy of Freemasonry, you find the Black Pope. She already said it at that time, and Papa Saucy is confirming that right here in our book, Rulers of Evil. That the unknown superior, a superior whose will the master's whole struggle up the degrees had trained him to obey without any question, what that master never realized was that his mysterious personage, as we shall examine in more detail later, was in fact none other than the Black Pope, Papa Nero. A century after Trent, a descendant of Paul III, Ranuccio Farnese, commissioned the great Venetian painter Sebastiano Ricci to commemorate the genesis of this definitive council. Sebastiano produced his famous Paul III and the Cardinals en route to Trent. The work is breathtakingly candid. In the air, above the Pope's head, hovers a deity, directing the entourage onward. The deity is not Jesus or Mary or Yahweh, God of the Bible. It is Mercury of the Sibylline and Virgiline Gospels, the Holy Scripture of Caesarean Rome. And when you want to take a look at this painting a few pages before, I'm now on page 82 in the, uh, in the book, uh, in the PDF, that's 59 in the book, three pages before, there is this painting and you can have a look at itself because Tapasosi made a sketch of this. Or you can, of course, look it up uh, online um, about this artwork um, that, that he did. Paul III and the Cardinals en route to Trent. I think when you Google it, you will find it and you can look for yourself. Mercury is the celebrated god of commerce. The metal most essential to commercial fluidity is named for him. Metallic mercury is known to scientists as the element Hg, derived from the Latin hydragerium, liquid silver. It is Hg's unique chemical nature that produces refined gold, the fundamental substance in which commercial value is denominated. Liquid at room temperature, Hg or mercury, draws impurities out of gold or and binds them into an amalgam. When the amalgam is heated, the heat drives away both Hg and the impurities. What is left is pure gold, suitable for further amalgamation into coin. Mercury's theological life began in ancient Babylon, where he was known as Marduk. The Bible calls him Merodach. The Hebrews call him Enoch. The Egyptians called him Thoth. The Scandinavians worshipped him as Odin, the Teutons as Wotan, and the Orientals as Buddha. Livy says he was introduced to the Romans in 495 BC as a Latinate version of the Greek god Hermes. By whatever name, in whatever culture, Mercury is considered the god of universal mind, of writing, number and thought. Just as mercury, the metal, draws out impurities and binds them into a mess that is burnt and discarded, mercury, the deity, uses his intellectual brilliance to play Pied Piper to impure humanity. He attracts followers and leads their souls to Hades, for which the Greeks gave him the title Psychopompas, from Psycho or Soul and Pompus, Director, soul director. Because Hades is not the most desirable of destinations, the psychopomp had to construct elegant missionary adaptions. He had to charm souls, deceive them into following him any, in any way he could, whether by words, sights or sounds. Like Mercury, H.G., his metallic form, Mercury could change his shape instantaneously. Did you see the villain in the movie Terminator 2? With his ever-changing voices, physiognomies and identities, he is state-of-the-art psychopomp. 
and many cultures, Mercury's indigenous deceptions earned him the title of the trickster. He was patron deity of deceivers and of thieves. Even as a baby, Mercury couldn't resist stealing Apollo's cattle. I find this mentioning of the movie Terminator 2, Judgment Day, very interesting part, because there you see this other Terminator, than uh, the counterpart of Arnold Schwarzenegger in that movie, playing a person made of mic liquid metal, who can take any form, shape, or whatever. And here you can see how all these Hollywood movies, of course, are influenced by this, I can call it also Kabbalah, these old Babylonian belief systems. Was Sebastiano Ricci telling us that Mercury was the dominating spirit of the, on the Council of Trent? Certainly the Council required, and still requires, Roman Catholics to honor many traditions which the Bible either condemns or does not authorize. Yet the Council also required, and still requires, that the Bible be honored as divinely inspired. Honoring the Bible by advocating unbiblical norms? This calls for a skill worthy of the psychopomp, a skill that makes one believe that black is white. As we've seen, this is the Jesuit skill, securing obedience of the subject's understanding. If indeed the Society of Jesus performs the function of Mercury, it is participating in a natural process known to pagan and biblical scriptures alike, a process by which impure humanity is attracted to oblivion, leaving behind only the pure. The theological implications of this process we shall discuss toward the end of this book. So I ask you to be a little bit patient when you want to go on with that, or <laughs> download the book and read it for yourself, if you will. With the Inquisition and the Council of Trent to pave their way, the Society of Jesus quickly became what Loyola had dreamed it would become, the Resurrected Knights Templar. In the next chapter, we shall examine the continuation of their meteoric rise as developers of the modern world. So this was chapter 8, then we will start in chapter 10, also in chapter 10, before uh, chapter 9, excuse me, before we begin reading chapter 9, when you go to the next pages, there you will see another uh, design, another drawing that was made of Ignatius in heaven, Padre Pozzo's spectacular ceiling at the Church of St. Ignatius in Rome. Note how the light emanates from Ignatius rather than Jesus Christ, who still bears his cross. So when you have a look at this painting, it's very interesting to see. Now, after moving in, in chapter 9, we are now turning into, ch in chapter 8, we are now turning to chapter 9, called Securing Confidence. Strengthened by Trent's unqualified endorsement, the Jesuits quickly became the Church's most popular confessors. Ignatius directed that, quote, a Jesuit should not allow anyone to leave the confessional entirely without comfort, unquote. If a confessant's opinion on any matter could be found in the least bit defensible, Ignatius said, quote, he should be permitted to adhere to it, even when the contrary opinion can be said to be more correct, unquote. People relished confess confessing to Jesuits, quote, always go to the Jesuits for confessions, unquote, it was said in Germany, quote, for they put cushions under your knees, and under your elbows, too. Hmm. Unquote. So you're sitting right comfortably, and that's why you should go there. Okay. Merchants, aristocrats, courtiers, and crowned, har crowned hats insisted that Jesuit confessional direction was the best in all Christendom. They considered the Jesuits to be the greatest converters of hardened sinners, the surest moral guides through life's bewildering complexities. Indeed, for two centuries all the French kings, from Henry III to Louis XV, would confess to Jesuits. All German emperors after the early 17th century would confess to Jesuits too. Jesuits would take the confessions of all dukes of Bavaria after 1579, 
most rulers of Poland and Portugal, the Spanish kings in the 18th century and James II of England. The sacrament of confession kept Jesuit information channels loaded with vital state secrets. It also furnished the society an ideal vehicle for influencing political action. One of the most dramatic instances is found in the famous memoir of François de la Chaise, Jesuit confessor to the painfully deceased King of France from 1675 to 1709. May a time since wrote La Chaise. Many a time since, wrote La Chaise, when I have had him, Louis the Fourteenth, at confession, I have shook hell about his ears, and made him sigh, fear, and tremble, before I would give him absolution. By this I saw that he had still an inclination to me, and was willing to be under my government. So I set the baseness of the action before him by telling the whole story, and how wicked it was, and that it could not be forgiven till he had done some good action to balance that, and expiate the crime. Whereupon he at, uh, at last asked me what he must do. I told him he must root out all heretics from his kingdom. Louis obeyed his confessor by revoking the Edict of Nantes in October 1685 which immediately resulted in the demolition of all the remaining Protestant temples throughout France and the entire prohibition of even private worship under penalty of confiscation of body and property, the banishment of all Protestant pastors from France within fifteen years, the closing of all Protestant schools, the prohibition of parents to instruct their children in the Protestant faith, the injunction upon them under a penalty of 500 livres uh, in each case, to have their children baptized by the parish priest and brought up in the Roman Catholic religion, the confiscation of the property and goods of all Protestant refugees who failed to return to France within four months, the penalty of the galleys for life to all men and of imprisonment for life to all women detected in the act of attempting to escape from France. Now, this is kind of an open prison, right? It was inevitable that the Council of Trent would establish the Jesuits as the schoolmasters of Europe. With money from royalty and commerce, and not so much as a pfennig from the church, a pfennig is uh, a cent in the old German Marx system, and not so much as a pfennig from the church, the society built an extensive system of schools and colleges. No tuition was charged, but each prospective student was thoroughly examined to see if he had aptitudes the society could use. With the founding of the first Jesuit school in Coimbra, Portugal, by the emperor's youngest sister Catharina, which, by the way, is Enigius' romantic interest who had since married the king of Portugal, you probably remember that from stating Tapasosides in earlier chapters. The principal Jesuit occupation became teaching. By 1556, three-fourths of the society's membership were dedicated in 46 Jesuit colleges to learning against learning, to indoctrinating minds with the learning of illuminated humanism as opposed to the learning of scripture. This network would expand by 1749 to 669 colleges, 176 seminaries, 61 houses of study, and 24 universities, partly or wholly under Jesuit direction. Many Protestant families sent their sons to Jesuit school, despite Martin Luther's early warning in an appeal to the ruling class in 1520 that, quote, unless they diligently train and impress scripture upon young students, schools will prove to be widened gates of hell, unquote. The Jesuit curriculum, or ratio studiorum, the method of study, gave scripture significant inattention. Part 4 Section 351 of Loyola's Constitutions prescribes courses in, quote, the humane letters of different languages, logic, 
natural and moral philosophy, metaphysics, scholastic and positive theology, unquote, with, quote, sacred scripture, unquote, bringing up the rear. How rigorously any one of these subjects was to be studied depended upon circumstances of times, places, persons, and other such factors according to what seems expedient in our Lord to him who holds the principal charge. Section 366 puts scripture at the mercy of these factors. Quote, the scholastics should acquire a good foundation in Latin before they attend lectures on the arts, and in the arts before they pass on to scholastic theology, and in it before they study positive theology. Scripture may be studied either concomitantly or later on. If scripture should be studied at all, the commentary and critical interpretation of Protestant scholastics were to be ignored. In the case of Christian authors, even though a work may be good in it, uh, may be good, it should not be lectured on when the author is bad, lest attachment to him be required. Quote, the curriculum of the Jesuit colleges came to be adopted to a great extent as the basis of the curricula of the European colleges generally, unquote, wrote Dr. James J. Walsh, Dean of Fordham University Medical School. Moreover, according to Dr. Walsh, quote, the founding fathers of our American Republic, that is to say the groups of men who drew up and signed the Declaration of Independence, who were the leaders in the American Revolution and who formulated the Constitution of the United States, were, the majority of them, educated in the colonial colleges or in corresponding colleges abroad, which followed almost exactly the Jesuit Ratio Studiorum. The fact has been missed to a great extent in our histories of American education. Unquote. Embedded in the Ratio Studiorum were the elements of entertainment, of dramatic production, composition, rhetoric and eloquence. These courses interlinked with the spiritual exercises to intensify the experiential experientiality of Catholic doctrine over scripture and Protestantism. They resulted in a genre of spectacular plays that won distinction as Jesuit theater. The first Jesuit theater was performed in Vienna in 1555, nearly 40 years before the emergence of Shakespeare. It was instantly popular and quickly spread to other parts of Europe. Between 1597 and 1773, more than 500 Jesuit theatricals were staged in the Lower Rhine, in the Lower Rhine region alone. Jacob Biedermann's play Kenodoxus, uh, Kenodoxus, sorry, means uh, Newfangled Beliefs, a point-by-point -point rebuttal of Luther's teachings, proved the power of the entertainment to achieve political reform. Quote, such a wholesome impression was made, wrote Father Beidemann recalling the 1609 opening of Xenodoxus in Munich, that a full 14 persons of the highest rank of the Bavarian court retired into solitude during the days that followed to perform the spiritual, uh, spiritual exercises and to reform their manner of living. Truly a hundred sermons would not have done so much good. Unquote. Yeah, now you see how everything that we have said in all the broadcasts uh, about the mainstream media industry, the film industry, the movie industry, um, the television and all that already started in 1555 with the Jesuit theater. It's all a modern version of that and nothing else. So th please throw your television out can't even tell the time right. An exemplary Jesuit drama performed in 1625 at the College of St. Omer in honor of Belgian royalty allegorized the glorious end to civil war in Belgium brought by the advent of Princess Isabella and her husband Albert. The play, as reviewed by a contemporary official, 
represented a country long heavily oppressed under the Iron Age, supplicating the help of Jupiter, who, after having summoned a council of the gods, sent down Saturn, lately married to Astraea. These visitors were received with much pomp by twelve zodiacs, or princes, sent by Mercury. They then dispatched four most potent heroes, Hercules, Jason, Theoseus, and Perseus, from the Elysian fields, with commands to conquer Iron Age, war, error, and discord. The heroes expelled those terrible monsters from the country and substituted in their stead Golden Age, Peace, Truth, and Concord. The princes with the whole assembly were highly delighted. The faculty of Munich College praised the way Jesuit theater captivated Protestants, especially the parents of school-aged youngsters. Quote, there is no better means of making friends out of the heretics and the enemies of the church and filling up the enrollment of the school than good high-spirited play-acting. Moliere's Jesuit theatricals in Paris were so popular that even the dress rehearsals were sold out. Mozart, at the age of eleven, was commissioned to write music for a play at the Jesuit College in Salzburg, where his father was musical director to the Archbishop. Even from the West Indies a Jesuit missionary reported that, quote, nothing has made a more forceful impression on the Indians than our play, unquote. In England, Jesuit theatre was not known as such because of Queen Elizabeth's statute making it a capital crime to be or even assist a Jesuit within her orbit. But if the purpose of Jesuit theatre was to capture that share of man's spiritual attention which might otherwise have been directed toward the Bible, then England certainly produced the greatest Jesuit playwright of them all. Shakespeare occupies us with the human process in a way that subtly marginalizes the Bible, exactly pursuant to the Jesuit mission. Well, there's so much I could uh, I could put in a comment here on the things that I've just read. I mean, um, you really have to go uh, slowly about these pages to understand all of that. But just an example: when when he was speaking about Mozart at the age of eleven, eleven was commissioned to write music for a play at Jesuit College in Salzburg. All these people that we know throughout history, uh, whether it's Beethoven or Mozart or Wagner, all these people who were playing a role as composers or writers or whatever, all these people were playing the agenda because otherwise they would have never had that success that they had. And of course, Jesuits pick one, use one, and then throw them down. So that's also why some of these people after quite a f successful life afterwards, they have just been disposed of. Well, the Jesuits are, in that opinion, just the same as Satan is. Satan uses people, and when he has used them, he disposes of them. He doesn't care for the people. It's such a shame that people don't learn that, but they care for Satan instead. So just this going back to Mozart here, and then of course we are going now a little bit deeper into Shakespeare, I think, and Shakespeare is also not the person that you thought it was, and uh, otherwise if you think different, then I advise you to uh, do a little bit research on Shakespeare. Shakespearean characters do preach, and they preach a religion, but it is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the Gnostic illumination of Medici learning that Shakespeare preaches, the stuff of Jesuit schools. Not surprisingly, the secret tradition of Templarism claims Shakespeare, at least the writer of his plays, to have been a Rosicrucian steeped in Medici learning. Well, get confession of, uh, confirmation of what I just told you. The philosophic ideals promulgated throughout Shakespearean plays distinctly demonstrate their author to have been thoroughly familiar with certain doctrines and tenets peculiar to Rosicrucianism. In fact, 
the profundity of Shakespearean production stamps their creator as one of the Illuminati of the ages. Who but a Platonist, a Quabalist, or Pythagorean could have written The Tempest, Macbeth, Hamlet, or The Tragedy of Cymbeline? Who of the uh, who but one deeply versed in Paracelsian lore could have conceived a Midsummer Night's Dream. Yet, as Gary Wills in his book Witches and Jesuits points out, Macbeth is an elaborate condemnation of the Jesuits as Satanists, murderous witches. Macbeth is one of the many of its periods power plays, a genre in which certain buzzwords well understood by contemporaries memorialize the guilt and execution of eight Jesuits for having schemed the gunpowder plot of November 5th, 1605. The plot aimed to blow up the entire government of Great Britain, including the royal family, in a single catastrophic explosion under the House of Parliament. How could a play defaming Jesuits be of the service to the Jesuit agenda? As we shall see, Warfare in defense of the papacy requires extravagant measures. In fact, both the, gun, the gunpowder plot, which failed, and the celebration of its detection, which lives on in Macbeth, served Rome abundantly. King James the thir the I, who declared himself the plot's divinely illuminated discoverer, blamed the plot on Jesuits and papists, but at the same time J James exonerated, quote, less fanatical Catholics, unquote. According to Wills, quote, the plot gave James his best opportunity to separate loyal and moderate Catholics from the mad extremists of the plot. In short, the plot secured England for loyal and moderate Roman Catholicism. In the reasoning of a superior general, particularly the general of the gunpowder plot and Shakespearean theatre, Claudio Acquaviva, Aqua Viva, the sacrifice of eight Jesuits was a small tactical price to pay for moving the King of England to express confidence in the Pope's British subjects, estimated at half the population of the realm. Okay, I will stop reading here. We still have a little bit to go next time in chapter 9. Just a page or two, three, I guess, we have to go for. A little, a little more, but I'm come to the end of time at 42 minutes, so I'm going to stop right here, and then we will continue next time our reading on page 69 of the book, or 92 in the PDF, as you probably follow. I hope this was as interesting for you as it was for me, because there were parts that I've just read for the first time. You probably could see that on my pronunciation, that here and there some of my words were not perfect. I excuse myself for that, but I'm not a native English speaker, and even sometimes I have some troubles um, reading the words right it's the way they are standing there. So, Okay, I thank you very much for your attention, and uh, hope you enjoyed it, and hope you come back for the next reading, and this was Rules of Evil, Chapter 8, and part of Chapter 9, Rules of Evil from Tapasosi for today. Thank you for listening, thank you for watching, God bless you, and... Bye-bye.